Well, welcome to week two of Strange Things in the Bible. Apparently, there's a show out there called Stranger Things. It's kind of like a big deal. And Strange, Stranger Things is actually, it's a rescue story. It's about four friends looking for their friend, Will, with the help of their mom. And there's a place called the Upside Down. It's not a good place. You don't want to go there. Bad things happen. Well, today I'm not going to really talk about that show, but I'm going to show you something very strange in the scriptures. I mean, really, really strange. I mean, there are some Bible stories that are out there that you're just like, whoa, that's kind of strange. But then there are others that you're like, wow, that's really, really strange. Did that really happen? How did that happen? What does God want me to learn from this very strange lesson? So today I want to talk about, again, a really strange story. Well, let me get set up the context for you. There was a guy in the Bible named Moses. He was God's leader. God chose him to lead God's people away from Pharaoh, out of Egypt, toward the promised land. Well, on their way there, the people, after they, you know, the Red Sea collapsed onto the army chasing them, they, got, they started going into the wilderness, and the people began to complain. And so God said, you guys are being negative. How many of us know negativity? It takes us nowhere. And so... Many people, over 20 years of age, they died in the wilderness because they complained. Some spies went out and did this mission. They said, we can take the land that God has for us. And they said, no, we can't. And so God was frustrated with his people. And so then all of a sudden, one day, something happens. I mean, if you thought it was strange that God was going to take out a lot of people, well, this is even stranger. So today, we're going to look at Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 16, starting in verse 1. It says, one day... Korah, Korah, let's say that name together, one, two, three, Korah, not Cobra, Korah. Korah conspired with Dathan and Abiram. They incited a rebellion, re re rebellion, rebellion against Moses along with 250 other leaders of the community. They united against Moses and Aaron and said, You've gone too far. Parents, we've had to say it to our children before, right? You've gone too far. You've gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people, Moses? When Moses heard what they were saying, Moses fell face down on the ground. He was like, Korah, what are you doing? God, don't wipe him out. Man, don't wipe all the people out. Moses, the leader whom God chooses, God always chooses a leader. He had this heart of like, man, what are you doing? Why are you jamming God? Why are you rebelling? What's happening here? Verse 9, it says that he said to Korah, hey, does it seem insignificant to you that the God of Israel has chosen you from among all of the community of Israel to be near him so you can serve in the Lord's tabernacle? and stand before the people to minister to them. Verse 10, Korah, he has already given this special ministry to you and your fellow Levites. Are you now demanding the priesthood as well? The Lord is the one you and your followers are really revolting against. Look out, Korah, Korah's rebellion. It's kind of a strange title, Korah's rebellion. What was happening? So this guy named Korah, he shows up, he's like, Moses, man, you're not the only person who can lead. God's with all of us. And then he goes on, it's like, you're not, you're not really happy with where you are in life, so you begin to get all these people and you revolt against the leader. Moses is like, this is what's gonna happen, Korah. You're gonna show up and there's gonna be a showdown. You're gonna show up, there's gonna be a showdown. And God's gonna pick in front of everyone who the real leader is. Moses says, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna meet together and we're gonna get these, these pots that they put in incense in this spice, and it's gonna go up to God as an act of worship. And then God's gonna show us who the real leader is, who's really rebelling, authority issues. I mean, isn't that really what it's about, authority issues? How many of us have authority issues? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you, you have lying issues. No one likes to be told what to do. Authority, it's the ultimate character test. I remember my daughter, Addie, she was five, five years old. She was rebelling. She didn't want to do what her dad told her to do. I said, well, Addie, ultimately, God is the author of authority. So if you have a problem with authority, me being your boss, you've got a problem with God. So right there in front of me, Addie's five, her blonde hair, I think she had a pink streak in, streak in it at the time, looked right at me, closed her eyes, 
folded her hands and said, God, don't let my dad be the boss of me anymore. <laughs> Authority issues. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody likes it. From the police officer to the pastor to the parent to the coach to the boss, we all have authorities in our lives. And how they lead us, they'll be held accountable to God, but how we respond to them and the leadership that God has placed them in our lives, we will stand and give an account of our life before God. Or, I mean, really, we'll stand before God, but we'll all kneel before him because he's God and we're not. Romans 13, one says, all the authorities, check this out, man, all of the authorities, everyone must submit to them. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. And then it goes on to say, for there's no authority except which God has established. The, the authorities that exist have been established by God. So who put the authorities in charge? Ultimately, it's not an authority issue you have, it's a God issue you have. Well, I don't like that person leading me. I don't like that person coaching my child, that teacher, that principal, that spiritual leader, that pastor, that police officer, that, that supervisor. I don't like them, but ultimately, the authority problem is with God if we're reading the Bible, which is ultimately a book full of some strange stories. So there's gonna be a show up, there's gonna be a showdown, and you're gonna find out. Romans 13, two, it tells us that when it comes to, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment Judgment, would God do that? Would God really? <clears throat> would God really judge people? Would he, would he really jam people and get people? Well, how do we experience the blessings in the favor of God? We choose to obey him or we choose to go our own way. We become prey and it doesn't end well for us. So do we obey or do we disobey? How are you handling the authorities in your life. Turn the person next to you and say, man, that's strange. <clears throat> Turn to your second option and tell them, I'm telling you, you're strange too. It's strange. I'd have a H2O liquid moment right there. Thank you. Thank you for all of those watching online. Let's give it up for everybody watching online. <clears throat> wow. The weather here is great, isn't it? Is the weather here awesome or what? You woke up this morning, you're like, I'm not going to church today, it's so cold. But we're talking about strange things. My husband's strange, my kids are strange, the Bible's strange. I'm gonna be strange, I'm gonna go to church today. That's kind of what I said. And then I came. I would have had to fire myself if I didn't show up. Or my staff would have been like, where are you? I should do that one weekend, just not show up and just freak everybody out. That'd be a good idea. He's like, you're waiting, the bumper's playing. No one shows up. He's coming. He's in the bathroom. He's doing his hair, something. I don't know. Well, that was a strange moment, so. What can we learn from this strange story in the Bible? Revolting against God, going against God. Number one, be careful who you follow. Who are you following? Who are you running with? Korah was a divisive person. Korah made it look like he was for everyone yet he was really for himself. How do you know if you're running with the Korah clan? How do you know? How do you know if you're Korah? Watch what, not what people say, but what people do. When they share you the sob story, point them back to scripture. Point them back to scripture. Not what they just say, but what they do. The methods of Korah, what did Korah do? He gathered people. He gathered a they group. He said, oh man, Moses isn't the only leader, I'm a leader. Yeah, that, that may be true, but God has a structure, God has a system, God always works in order, not chaos. And so they began to go, you know what? Man, you could do it better than Moses. You'd be, you'd be a great leader. Man, why is him and Aaron? The, it's all about Aaron and Moses. It's the Aaron and Moses show. What is happening here? Man, we're leaders too. And they began to listen to gossip, they began to sway a they on their team, the DA's office, Dathan and Abiram, the 250 influential leaders, they're like, man, you're not the only leaders anymore. I mean, we have something to say. Be careful of Korahs in the business place. 
in the church world, on the sports team, in your families. Korah's rebellion, the corruption of Korah. It's crazy, man. It is strange. Yet the Apostle Paul, one of the great leaders in church, he told us something to a young pastor named Titus in Titus 3.10. He said, warn a divisive person one time, a person who tries to split, who tries to divide things. Warn him a second time and then have nothing to do with them. Why does the Apostle Paul say that? Why does God's word say that? Because he knows that the strange thing that's happening, man, it can come and crush your life as well. Be careful who you're following. Be careful. Watch not what they say, but what they do. What else can we learn from this story? Man, we can learn a lot of stuff. Well, for certain, if we wanna find Will, like they did in Stranger Things, if you wanna find not Will in the movie, but the will of God from your maker, you've gotta give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks where you are. What was the real problem in this story? So these guys rebelled, but why were they rebelling? They were rebelling because Korah didn't like what he was in charge of anymore. He's like, I don't wanna do this anymore. His job was a great job. They were to get the holy thing. See, in that day, the tabernacle, the tent meeting, it was a portable church. They, they took it out there, they set it up. There was a holy things where there's holy, holy items. Their job was to carry those things. They were, that's their job. They were carrying them. However, they didn't dig it anymore. And they wanted to do what Aaron and the priesthood do. They're like, man, we should be doing what you're doing. Have you ever gotten jealous before? I still get jealous. Jealous? Remember that, that band, the Jonas Brothers? Man, they were so good. They should have never split up. Jealousy. Jealousy is believing you deserve something that someone else got. Oh, they got the job. They got the promotion. They got the internship. They got the guy. They got the girl. Jealousy. It's U-G-L-Y. You ain't got no alibi. You ugly. That's what jealousy is. It's ugly. Man, it will come and creep into your life, and before you know it, oh. And oftentimes, we're jealous of other people, others' talents and gifts, and really, we don't even want their talents. We don't even want their gifts. I've thought before times in ministry as a pastor, I've looked at other pastors and friends that I look up to and I thought, man, it, it'd be nice if I could do that, speak there, do this, do that. And then I think about it and I'm like, I hate flying. I hate leaving my kids. I, I, I would never wanna be away from my wife for more than like two or three hours. You know, at least driving distance, you know. I'm like, I don't wanna travel the whole world. I don't even, I don't even want to do what I think I want to do. These guys were jealous. They, they were jamming Moses. They're like, man, we want to do this now. The problem was that they forgot to be thankful for what they had. Be careful looking for something you don't have that you forget what you do have. Be careful looking for something you don't have, you forget what you do have. What has God entrusted you with? What has God given to you? Korah. The corruption crept in when he said, I don't want this, I want that. And it's not wrong to have dreams, it's not wrong to have goals or have ambitions, but make sure you're thankful where you are. Again, that 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks. Give thanks wherever you are. That's the will of God for your life, to give thanks where you are. How do you give thanks? I mean, here's one, you ready? Let's see how smart you are. How do you give thanks? All you really have to do is say it. If you're thankful for your spouse, say it. If you're thankful for your kids, some days you are, some days you might not be, say it. If you're thankful for your job, in those meetings, say it. If you're thankful for your church, say it. I got, got some people in the front row. And if you're thankful, say it. What, what, imagine that. Imagine if we walked around, we got the coffee from Starbucks and, we, and they gave us the coffee and we said, thank you. Shocker, I know. Imagine when the teacher gave us the grade, students, we looked at it and we're like, ah, I didn't like the grade. Hey, thank you. We said to the coach for benching us, oh man, I can't believe they're doing that to my child. You have no idea how good they are. Hey, thank you for coaching this team. Hey, thank you for sacrificing. Thank you for giving of your time. 
Thanksgiving should not happen for Christians just in November. It happens every day. <laughs> Say it. What, I mean, what if we just said it? So give thanks where you are. Give thanks where you are. Hey, are you thankful? Are you saying it? Are you spraying it? Korah's corruption started with an unthankful heart. Unthankful. And you know what, though? The thing is, that unthankful heart, man, that will take you to the upside-down life that God does not have for you. Man, it, it, is, it is an unthankful heart, an ungrateful heart is the doorway to a lot of bad things. So when we sing songs to God, when we're singing, you might not know this song. You're like, what is this about? Why are they singing these songs? These songs of praise are songs of thankfulness. And so when you come and you stand in the presence of God in a holy place, and you choose to thank God, or you choose to go, I'm gonna unlock the door to the upside down life, to the life that God doesn't want me. When you refuse to give God his praise, when you refuse to give God thanks, man, you're inviting rebellion into your life. God, I'm not gonna thank you. I'm not gonna praise you for who you are. I'm gonna praise myself. But when we get it off of ourselves, that's, that's Korah's downfall. Korah said he was making it about everybody else, but he was really making it about himself. And you know the thing that amazes me the most of this whole passage of scripture? It's not Korah, there's always a Korah. And there's always a few haters that can join him emotionally. They're like, oh yeah, you're right. But it's the 250 who were silent. Hey, they, they may have kind of agreed with Korah, but didn't agree with everything. But they said nothing. They were silent. Martin Luther King once said, in the end of our lives, we won't remember what our enemies said, but that our friends were silent. Or should we say so-called friends? They said nothing. These people had seen God move through Moses and Aaron and God save them and rescue them and take out the Egyptians and provide for them food and water, provide for their families. And then when Moses was falsely accused, Aaron was falsely accused, these people were silent. See, we need to be careful who we follow. We need to give thanks where we are, but we also need to not scream the truth in silence. Opportunities to stand up for the right thing, the righteous thing. Yet when we're silent, we take the position of agreement. And there's a lot of Christ followers who are silent when it comes to doing the right thing. Now let me give you something very, very practical. I wanna tell you, please do not take this point and take it and go on social media and try to win an argument. You're never gonna win an argument on social media. Who are you fooling? It's social media, social me, social my opinion, social me, not social he. You're never going to win some argument. Oh, man, my, my pastor said don't be silent. So they're promoting this agenda. They're promoting this thing. I'm not going to be silent. I'm saying it. I'm spraying it. I'm wheeling and dealing it. I'm saying the truth, living for truth. I'm going to put it on there. No, you're never going to win. You, I mean, you're, you're smoking something. I mean, that's strange. You're not gonna do that. Man, don't do that. When you do that, honestly, man, we look silly. Have you ever just seen someone you love just fire back some comment, and you're like, it's not a Christ-like response? And you've thought about doing it. I've thought about doing it, oh, so many times. And I, thankfully, I have some great accountability, some great pastors. I said, if you ever see me fire anything on social media, please call me. Man, we've all thought about that. But it's social media. It's about the person making the statement. Man, stand up for truth and righteousness. How would we do that? When there's the opportunity to get into the gossip center, step out of it, step away from it. And man, you know, you do know your friends who gossip to you, your friends, they're talking smack about you behind your back. I mean, do we need to like take a nap on this and park this one down for a little bit? You know, just, man, when they're saying stuff about, you know, Bill and Tina and how they're living their life, I mean, you know, once they leave that conversation, they're talking about you. 
right? I mean, we, 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 got, we got to be smarter than that, right, people? Man, be careful. Oh, man, you sink down on this couch. You barely get up. <laughs> Roll off of it. You, yeah, they're, they're saying stuff about you behind your back. Oh, no, they're not, man. We're tight. No, you ain't. And so, again, when you hear the sob story, you got to point him back to Scripture. you got to point him back to who you want to be. And you and I, we're called to be like Jesus. I mean, we've all got sucked in. We've all gotten swallowed into a conversation. We all got an opportunity when a family member is jamming another family member. Hey, we can build up or we can tear down. Our words can speak life. Our words can speak death. What are, what are our words doing? Is our life under the authority of Scripture? All authority is given to us by God. He's the author of authority. What are you doing with that authority, with that, those structures over your life? And it's amazing to me, the most rebellious people I've ever met in my entire life are people who knew this, maybe better than I did, but were never, and this is just for me speaking, the most rebellious people I've ever met in my entire life were never the people who were, you know, kind of arrogant and cocky. I mean, we can, everybody can notice those people, but are the people who on the inside, instead of supporting you, we're talking smack about you. I mean, I've seen it. So be careful, not what people say, but watch what people do. Man, I hope at the end of my life, people will be able to go, man, like his grandpa, my grandpa, why I love my grandpa. I never heard my grandpa say anything bad about anyone. And even when it was true, he would kind of just go, <clears throat> and he had a toothpick in his mouth all the time. Never said anything bad about anyone. No, I'm not saying he's perfect, but I, I never saw that, and I knew him well. I never saw that. What if they could say that about you? What if they could say that you're the type of person who would stand up and go, hey, that's not right. Hey, this is the right thing to do. Hey, this is the right thing to say. We're called to live honorable lives. We're called to live a life worthy of the calling that we're called to live, to follow Jesus, to be faithful to him. Man, what are the consequences? What are the consequences? What's, what, what happens? What happens in this strange story in the Bible to Korah and this whole corruption that is happening? Verse 20. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, get away from all of these people so that I may instantly destroy them. Again, the Bible tells us that Moses fell face down. He was praying for the people. He's like, Man, these, these yahoos are running it for everybody. God, don't destroy them. Moses, the man of God, his first response isn't to post it on social media. His first response is to pray for the people who are taking people down. And Moses, he, he tried to meet with Dathan. He tried to meet with Abiram. He tried to have the conversations. He's like, God, I haven't done anything wrong here. And then Moses says, hey, something unusual. If it happens... Man, it's God. So we're gonna stand here. And they were all gathered, all of the people gathered together. They stood there. They began to take that incense and bring it as worship to God. Yet right as Moses began to say, if something unusual happened, something unusual began to happen. The Bible, or the Bible says that the ground began to rumble a little bit. And then in verse 32, the earth opened its mouth and <laughs> swallowed the men along with their households and all of their followers who were standing with them and everything they owned. So they went down into the grave along with all of their belongings. The earth closed over them and they all vanished from among the people of Israel. So you get to make a choice when Korah's corruption comes calling you. Rebellion, disrespect towards authority in your life comes calling, you can separate or you can get swallowed up. You're going to have that opportunity to separate at the workplace when they're dissing the boss, the job, the task at hand, swallowed up or separated. Aren't the people of God supposed to be holy, set apart? There should be different, something different about the way we live our life, about the way we say our words and carry on about our task in life. Separated, 
swallowed up. Authority. See, what makes the devil the devil? Rebellion. When we rebel, we're signing a deal with the devil. Whether we realize it or not, we're taking in the same steps, the same patterns. I'm not going to listen to my parents. I'm not going to listen to my boss. There's no way I'm listening to my pastor, that police officer, that person, that coach. I'm not listening to them. You're signing a deal with the devil. You're walking in the same footsteps of rebellion. That's what the devil did. The devil, Lucifer, led worship in heaven. He said, I'm not going to, I'm going to take the worship for myself. I'm going to do my own thing. And then he was kicked out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And what are you doing when it comes to authority in your life? See, the crazy thing is that the next day, the people complained and grumbled again. And God was so mad, he sent a plague, and people were just dropping like flies. 14,700 people died that day because they were like, oh, this isn't right. God was so tired of their negativity, so tired of their rebellion. A plague started to move amongst the people, but then the man of God, Moses and Aaron. Moses said to Aaron, Aaron, take that. Take that pot, take that incense, go put it around amongst the people. And in verse 48, <clears throat> it says that he stepped in the middle between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. Don't we have someone who's stepped into the middle of our rebellion? Jesus Christ. He stepped in the middle of our rebellion so that we could not die in our sins, but have eternal life forever. How many of you are thankful that Jesus did that for you <laughs> and for me? Strange stories in the Bible. Who are you following? Be careful who you follow. Give thanks where you are. Don't scream the truth in silence, but be separated so you don't get swallowed up. That's a strange story. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sins. God, we thank you that God in our own sin, in our own rebellion against you, God, you came 2,000 years ago. You died, was buried, and you rose again for us. You offer us a door to eternal life and life to the fullest. Father, if there's any here that are rebelling against what your word says, maybe against parents, from leaders, you name it, God, may they have the humble heart to come to you and confess that. Maybe you have rebellion against your spouse. The scriptures tell us to submit to those leaders, get under the rank, the order. It's a military term. Sometimes we need to submit to other Christians out of reverence for Christ. Submission actually brings freedom in our life. And that's what Jesus did. He submitted to the Father's will and we're called to do the same. Hey, if you're here today and you just be honest and say, Brian, hey, you're talking about authority issues. I have some, but my ultimate authority issue is with God. I've, I'm living my own way, I'm doing my own deal, but today I wanna to give my life to God. If that's you, I wanna give you an opportunity to invite God into your life and to turn from your rebellion and receive forgiveness. Just pray it right where you are. Just say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to down a cross for me today. God, I admit I need you. I turn from my rebellion and I put my belief and faith in Jesus Christ and his work on a cross. I'm confessing I need him. Maybe you're hearing you backslid and you've kind of wandered away from God. And he'd say, God, I, I've been rebellious. God, I've been doing my own deal, but I need to turn back to you. I'm praying that prayer. Hey, if you're praying that prayer and you're meaning it, would you just lift up your hand real quick between you and God? God, I'm, I'm giving my life to you. I'm asking you to forgive me. I want eternal life and forgiveness. Is there anybody here who would be honest and say, hey, that's me. Pray for me. I make that my prayer. Thank you for your honesty. Just pray it. Just say, God, I need you. I invite you into my life. Father, you see those that need to respond. And God, for a lot of us, it's often a heart issue, strange issues of authority that we have to work through. But God, ultimately, you are the author of authority. So when we get under what you put over us, God, one day you'll put us over what you wanna put under us. God, help us to live lives submitted to authorities, honoring you because you did the same. You modeled the way. Father, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.